Greetings, nerds. This is Cena Nerd. I'm your host, Sarah Belmont, and with me, as always, is our Mr. Producer, Will Polk. How are you doing today, Will? Good afternoon, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. You know, TCAs are going on right now, so everybody, I'm sure, is avidly looking at their Twitter feeds to get um, the latest updates. Yeah. And then a lot of tea. Uh, It was really funny because I know, I remember at Comic-Con, they announced that Katie Cassidy was going to direct an episode of Arrow this season. And so yesterday, I guess it was confirmed it's episode three of the season. And on my Twitter feed, it just like blew up with all of these disses towards her. And I'm just like, ah, this show, uh, it's it's (laughs) going on a bit too long. (laughs) This show, well, this is just... Obviously, Stan, fan, fandom, and fandom just again just showing this ugly head. But I don't want to dwell on that negativity, especially when we had some pretty uh, some good news come out of TCA today. As far as uh, there is going to be a Batman sighting, mm-hmm. uh, Kevin Conroy is going to be portraying a future Bruce Wayne in the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover. Yeah. And, and uh, so that's pretty pretty exciting news because uh, we we've had a lot of ghost and casting news and rumors and whatnot, but this one it was straight from the CW's mouth, and that's a pretty exciting bit of news. And also uh, earlier in the, I guess in the last week uh, there was rumors that Black Lightning was going to uh, appear on the Crisis and and uh, Crest. Williams confirmed it yesterday, but again, the the CW at TCA's confirmed that not only uh, Black Lightning was going to be there, but there may be some other members of the cast as well. Didn't give names, but uh, the simple fact that uh, Jefferson is is going to show up in the crisis uh, definitely opens the door for um, more shows. And uh, you know, as far as what are your thoughts on Black Lightning showing up in in the crisis? I love that. I I like it because that's what a big story arc like Crisis can really do is you can have you can bring a a show like Black Lightning to the fold finally. And then you can still play it off like, oh, but he is on this other Earth or maybe it's the same Earth we don't know yet. But they they still can keep it separated. I mean, it's one appearance. It doesn't mean like suddenly it's going to become Flash and Black Lightning team up every other or every season. So exactly. I don't think it's going to get to that point. But <clears throat> it just also is nice because Black Lightning is a show we've been watching now for two seasons. It's a good show. It's well written. And but what it's really missing is that reminder that it is part of this larger universe, this larger franchise. And so it just feels like it's it's a part of the family more than right. a second cousin twice removed. Exactly. Exactly. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And and I think it, it it will still retain its distinctiveness because of the way they are they're utilizing the character and, and bringing him in for the crisis, but not becoming uh, a full part of the, the, the crisis event as far as taking a show to say Friedland, uh, which we, we did get the schedule uh, this today as well, as far as when these shows are coming and Supergirl is December 8th, the Batwoman is December 9, and then the flash is December 10 to sort of close out the, the mid season finale and then it will turn in 2020 with Arrow and Legends both airing on January the 14th. So, so my question is: are, Is there one episode of Arrow airing in 2020, or are there two? I think there there was also news today from the president of the CW that said Arrow was going to get a special set a send off, and as well as Supernatural. So, my reading of that is: I think we will probably get an, an episode and two episodes in 2020 right because the way i mean even though the arrow panel pretty much reiterated most of the things from san diego comic-con it looks like the first uh eight or so eight or nine episodes will just basically as as what's been already reported and said by the cast and crew uh, a, a new arrow 
the era that we know ended and, and quite fittingly with uh, season seven. So this, this upcoming season, which apparently uh, will take a place about a week or so after what we saw with season seven, uh, I think Steven joked maybe six weeks, but in any event. So, yeah, but I still, so is episode eight, the crossover episodes for each show or is it episode nine? It looks like the the crossover event is happening around the mid season finales for each of the each of the shows. So mm-hmm. uh, most of them are premiering the first week or so of all of October. Uh, Black Lightning did get a change in their uh, return date. They're now going to be returning on October the seventh, but uh, it seems like everyone else will be returning around that 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 time frame so we typically have a a a break and the uh you know first few weeks of those shows probably around early november so it'll probably be no it's usually around thanksgiving they do a break and then they come back with their crossovers and or mid-season finales so it's just interesting i don't mind it um it's it depends on where it fits. Like, I that's why I'm really anxious to understand, like, are we getting two episodes, like right. nine and ten, and that's a two-part finale? Is yeah. episode eight just going to be the crisis? Is is it sort of a blend through episode eight and nine? Like, right. but, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> I'm also just, standing on the outskirts watching everything fall into place and i'm like i'm trying to keep my mind open i'm not mm-hmm. trying to get too excited because i have a feeling if i get myself excited i'm just going to be disappointed mm-hmm. so that's that's about it <laughs> yeah i understand i understand and i think i think given the comments that they'll give arrow a special send-off i i think the crossover will just sort of be blended into the eight up ep- the 10 episode run with Hopefully the series finale being a, a standalone episode, because I think it would just be, I think, out of respect for what all the show kicking off this 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 universe on the CW, which they also mentioned today that uh, there will be a, a, a possible new Arrow first DC based character show, probably around 2020, 2021 season, not not going to be a spinoff of Arrow, which many people have suspected. But, of course, the president of CW did say, never say never. But at least for now, it looks like they are going to be doing a future show. But getting back to Arrow, uh, hopefully we'll have the crossover. Everything will happen there, and then they will give the, the series its rightful standalone show, unlike they did a few years ago, where they I think it was their, what, their 100th episode that they had it aired during one of the crossover events yeah yeah they 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 did that and then last year with the flash the flash got to do some scheduling to make sure that that didn't happen exactly so they should definitely give the arrow the, the same kind of respect they did the flash okay meanwhile in dc we're gonna talk about krypton season two episode eight mercy this is an interesting episode and I say that with a grain of salt, a heavy grain of salt, because I will be honest. Half of this episode is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Half of it, I was bored. Mm-hmm. And it's just, they commit, the writers committed to sin. And we've talked about this sin in previous shows. The moment you explain something to the audience, mm-hmm. and then you're left watching all of the other characters become informed it's suddenly as a viewer you get bored because you're just like no i already understood that why are we why are we continuing to go down this path so the fact that in the second half of the episode they spent time not even Lida explaining what happened but also explaining and then showing additional like extended segments of the the fantasy world she was held captive in it just, I was just like, really? And I will be honest, I, I did what I do on a rarity, and I don't think I've ever done this with a Krypton episode. Um, I skipped ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I wow. already know. I don't yeah. really care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, I, I, I will agree with you there that uh, there was 
uh, unnecessary use of exposition in that moment. It, well, we're, let me go back a little bit to, before I get to, to that, I, my quibble with it is where I groaned, when I, my initial reaction when I first saw that Lida was actually, that we thought was dead, was actually alive. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I was like, damn, the show, they did it. They, yep. they, I, I was, um, nobody bored. saw that coming. No one saw that. You're uh-huh. right. And, you know, you made our show notes. We should have seen the cloning coming because cloning is a part of the show. Yeah. And it was, you know, why didn't we think of that? I think mm-hmm. that gives, it's a real testament to the, to the writers and the showrunners about how well they have constructed season two and that yes. we were so focused on the story and the, and all the things going on with Seg and Brainiac and, and quite frankly, Zod, you know, Colin Selman is the de- definitive Zod to me now. The with time all, travel. Yeah. The time travel with all due respect to Terrence Stamp and Michael Shannon, uh, he the the time travel the way he has just manipulated the situation to his advantage uh he he's the definitive side lobo all the things that we've seen up to this point really did a tremendous job setting up that moment in episode five where she was the clone was executed so i i will forgive them for that part of Uh I don't like where this is going. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Can I, I, I want to say one thing about Zod, though. Yeah. Um, because as you were talking, it, um, it reminded me they did confirm that that the clone was reconditioned by Zod. Exactly. Yep. So in all the previous discussions, we were kind of going back and forth on was Leda reconditioned or not. She wasn't, but her clone, her clone. was. She was just put to bed rest by a very ugly parasite, and um, basically, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it at this point. But continue. All no, right. No, no. What, what's the butt in this? The whole butt thing? is. I'm kind of mad at them for like taking the taking the clone way out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the setup, and it was beautiful, and it was. Uh, and we we talked about this a few weeks ago, about whether or not this will stick or not. And I we, I was I was hopeful that it would stick mm-hmm. because it was a legitimate game changer. And then they used the trap door of a clone mm. to to do that. But that being said, we did see some callback moments with with Jaina and Lyda taking the place of Seg and Lyda and that vision in the Phantom Zone. So I, I will I will still reserve judgment. It could just be delaying in the inevitable. Or that Lyda is still going to meet her ultimate demise. Uh, but if, it, if that does indeed happen, uh, I feel like the, 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 the shock value or game-changing value of it was 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 squandered away because they did it earlier in the season with the clone. So it's it's very interesting because I feel like we're in a total role reversal. Because in past episodes, when whenever a show has done something, I'm the one who's like, they took the the easy way out and everything, and now you're saying it and mean. I'm like, I didn't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> and and here's why. Yeah. They cannot do this again. Right. This is a one-time trick. If they do it again and again and again, they will really lose stakes. So far, my stakes still reaffirmed. And I understand why for some people watching this, it's kind of like, well, now anytime a character dies, I'm going to think, is it the clone? Right. So so really, if if the writers need to understand that they can't try this again, because the moment they do, stakes will infinitely drop. Yeah, they were back in the Arrowverse, and I don't want to be there. This is why it, I like this show so much. Right, exactly. Um, now, also about that Phantom Zone 
parallel. I felt like it did come true. The vision that Sag saw when he was in the Phantom Zone was was what happened to was what we are shown really did happen to Lyda right before she was put under the Black Mercy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and which I really liked because it it kind of did irritate me. I mean, as we're talking about like, well, she can't die because obviously Zod is still alive. And I know that's back to the future, which is complete BS, but still it makes sense in my mind. Mm -hmm. And yet also, what was the point of that scene in the Phantom Zone? So it just, I really liked it. I really, that first half of the episode As we're getting all of these layers pulled back, I'm like, this is brilliant Mm -hmm. because I had no idea it was going to come. They had already set it up with Nyssa. We knew clones were in here, but we were not focused on that. So I liked it. Mm -hmm. Now, second half of the episode, really boring. (laughs) (laughs) I cannot stress this enough how bored I was. Well, (laughs) it was. Literally, Will, I sent out that tweet, and then it was all downhill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there were some there there were some parts of it that that to make it did not make it completely boring to me because I even I, I was live tweeting from our account uh, Wednesday night as the show was happening in real time, so it was you know I didn't have time to like think about it. It was just gut reaction. Here's mm-hmm. here's what's going on. So. I do the second half of the episode. There were moments where I was like, "And here comes Lada in five, four, three, two, one." And I was, you know, I was yeah. thinking maybe here is where she she, she was going to conf- see Seg first before she ran into Jaina and, and Dev. And so those moments, those things worked for me. The reunion was very important, and I know they it was definitely a lot of over explanation about what happened and. I agree with you that the episode pretty much up to that point told us what happened. We didn't need to have another few lines of dialogue to basically rehash that. Mm-hmm. But the other, but I think the, the bigger thing, the takeaway that I got from it, well, one was just, it was just crushing because one Seg and Anissa have grown closer over these last few episodes. I know where you're going with this. Mm-hmm. Not only with the um, obviously the rechristening of Jarrell, the helping each other cope, you know, Seg cope with his the issues he was having with Brainiac, Nissa also trying to find her place in in this new world because she is because of her the Vex family had is an outcast, so they. Uh, their relationship was deepening. And so now you throw in Lyta's return. And, and so it was a very, it was a very heartbreaking, but also very melodramatic soap opera moment where you have a character you think is dead, who was obviously very, who was very close and, and ha- with SAG and they had their established relationship. And now you have this new one come up so there was a I, I felt for Nissa in that moment. Uh, I was wow. happy. I was I was I was happy for Elida on the one and Seg on the one hand, but also knowing what, but but also with the understanding in the back of my head, there Nissa met Seg and and Lida's relationship as Lida rightfully envisioned in in the Black Mercy. It will lead to tragedy on this planet. Mhm. Mhm. And and so the anguish that I felt for Nissa and Seg is that Jarrell is the is the hope for this planet because his offspring becomes Kal-el obviously and 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 Krypton survives because of that. So there was a lot going on in that in that sequence obviously beyond the beyond the rehashing of what happened to her. The other thing that really stood out to me in that moment was you had the Sagittari, you had a Vex, and you had Seg, who is the uh, unranked, all there together. And at that moment, 
we saw the houses of Krypton start to form together and, and unite because they have their common enemy inside. So it, it definitely was a good setup for Springboard for the last two episodes as far as what's going to happen this season. Yeah, I, the reunion, I felt, I, everything that you just explained about it, about it, it's, and this is this is what I really liked about that that moment at the end is this is how you set up a love triangle mm-hmm. or this is how you set up relationships where there is a conflict. And it's not just about love for what you just explained. It's about, well, how do we get to Superman from here? How do we get Krypton to where it's going to be? Uh, what are the dynamics that set up that trajectory? Because that's the future that Adam is aware of and Adam is came to preserve no adam was nowhere in this episode maybe that's why the second half was so boring anyway (laughs) (laughs) so i i just like it because and and again will what you just said you felt for nissa and i did too and i like how they didn't really hold it on her too long it was a brief camera movement and you Mm -hmm. saw the look on her face because Mm -hmm. That's that was the point. This is the first point of season two is these two relationships that SAG is in the middle of. It's going to come to a head. There are going to be consequences. Um, he, he Lida is the love of his life. We all know that we're not disputing that or anything. But to get to Kal-El, he actually should end up with Nyssa. Mm hmm. So, well, and, and maybe that's not even a fair point to make because jor is already born. <laughs> yeah, yeah, jor already so, born, so. But but it's still like this, maybe it's playing into our own ideas of like a whole family and what that dynamic should be, but it's just, it's very interesting and I do appreciate that we got there and I do see how the second half of this episode was really just a bridge to get our characters and really end this sh- this season with a big bang. Yeah, yeah, it, it totally it totally is, and um, yeah, I, I can't I really don't have much more to add about that that, that sequence. I, I think oh, one thing I have to add about the episode in and of itself is it was again you know touching back to some of our earlier points of how expanded this universe is, and like the Fort Ross mention, I, I just happen to think of our conversations about again how they we saw fort Roz and, and supergirl with um mm, with yep. the villain with the villain there and so yeah again it just it expands the this universe and i was joking with whenever we had our uh, crossover podcast with um with uh, geek vibes nation last week we were talking about the possibility of seg showing up in say crisis mm-hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> and uh it uh it, again this the show because of crisis and because of you know now with black lightning uh, I, I, being a part of it if there's some way they can make it work you know i Okay, fine. I mean, super, we have Kingdom Come Superman. Why not? <laughs> you know, actually, I don't think Seg would make sense. You know who would make sense? Adam Strange. Yes. Adam that, would make more that, sense. That would be the character to bridge those two shows together. Yeah. And yeah, actually, sure. if you use Crisis as, like, the big event that the consequences of Crisis and Adam observes it, and then that's how, why he ends up going back in time. Mm-hmm. You could that, totally do that. that. That's a great idea. That that's that is the better way to go. Totally. That's why. We, yeah. Totally. And because we're not going to do any better than that. <laughs> <note. laughs> Let's talk about the boys. The second half of the season. Did you finish it? I did. Okay. Good. Because I did two, four episodes. I am still exactly where I was a week ago where there's and actually no I take that back because there is a larger part of me that really likes this show um, because the final episode actually the final scene in the final episode was Mm -hmm. brilliant it was like it was so good it was in Anthony 
Anthony Starr, I think his name is, yeah. or yeah, Anthony Starr, who yeah. plays Homelander. Like, bravo. Brav freaking bo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're a mastermind. And it was like these last four episodes, you really continued to see the depth of his very, a very warped perception of what reality is, who he is, what, what Vought is and everything. And, and you know what? I also, in listening to um, what happened, the two stories he heard about what happened to his kid, um, I picked up on it too. That you know, Madeline slipped up. She said miscarriage, and mm-hmm. it's like hmm, that's mm-hmm. not how I just heard it described. It sounded like it came to birth, and it was an alien. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 hats off to him. And I think that's why he is so such a good villain is because he is smart. He's not dumb no. in any way. He, you do see like there is something about him where he can be manipulated because Madeline was doing that a lot this yeah. season. But she took advantage of his, I mean, obviously, especially when we see an episode six where we get the, the faux real, the, the campaign commercial of the set, the seven. And- oh my God. My favorite. Yeah, like, episode I six love, is my favorite episode, yeah. I love how they shot it at the very office style. Mm-hmm. And then whenever they would, like, have those moments that the, the soups didn't want them to hear, they would still try to creep in. And it was very office-like. It was so it great. Was. Yeah, it, it totally it totally was. And uh, But to your point about Madeline manipulating him, she took advantage of the fact that he, he that Oedipal, like, need you know he's missing a mother and you know, it was very oedipus rex and throughout the his the dynamic with her and the fascination with her and she definitely used that manipulation to use that to manipulate him to serve her ends and which was if there was any kind of like redeeming or or or, or the part that makes you have some vague sense of sorrow for Homelander that was probably about, about the only thing because he is just a evil bastard. <laughs> well, and I think that's what the second half of the season really explored is that, okay, you guys are on board that these are all a bunch of douchebags and mm-hmm. clearly they are not taking, they don't want responsibility. They're, they're tired or they're just, they're not, they've become this other thing. <laughs> entirely <laughs> yeah. and they're they're douchebags and and yet in the second half of the season they explore they really put it out there these people like they were babies mm-hmm. and scientists inter- injected them with all of these chemicals yep. altering their bodies altering who they were and so they were they were like um uh, Homelander even says that at point. I was a lab rat. I was raised yeah. in a lab. And yeah, that is very, very endearing to a viewer because you you realize at one point this who he became was decided for him at birth when he had yeah. no ability, no say. I yeah. think Starlight brings that up at one point as well. It's just to her mom. Mm-hmm. It's just like, this isn't what I wanted. This is what you wanted. Yep. And so so that was a very good plot point to make sure was fully understood that these people, who they are now, they didn't have a choice. Mm-hmm. It just, they were experiments. Yeah, they, they were experiments and they didn't have a choice. And and it's and, and the thing that this show really explored well, especially the back half of the season, because I felt the first half of the season, the first four episodes, I felt like you said they were just a bunch of douches and and all. And really, the second half of the back, the back five, back four, really explored the meaning for for why they are that way, and 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 everyone's own story uh, like for example a train and his interplays with his i guess that was his trainer i guess that was his brother yeah i feel like there was a family bond there a yeah. train i his character was interesting i always think of a train and the deep 
Mm-hmm. Very, very similar. They had smaller arcs, but important arcs. And A Train, th- that scene in the store when he's on crutches, mm-hmm. it was an interesting placement. Like, I, I wonder why they decided to place it at that point. Yeah. You know, because because that's something I would have expected maybe earlier on. But there was just something. And maybe it was because, you know, he's on crutches. Mm-hmm. He, he killed his girlfriend. He found out, like, all the reasons why he ended up killing her had to do with a mistake he made all the way back in episode one. Mm-hmm. And, and there is a lot of bad qualities about a train but then you see him kind of in this moment of like take away the powers take away all of that name and clout and suddenly he he is just another black man in a store and prejudice will still occur yep yep and i think that was yeah that was a power for me that was a very powerful moment in in this show and then Uh, what does he do he goes too far he goes (laughs) yep (laughs) goes way too far but i think it, it, and that's what and it, that's what makes this made the boys work for me was the, the complexities of of these characters and not just being a story oh it's very good or very bad and it, it is a very because especially once we learned that the compound compound B was used to create them uh, their destinies were were set mm-hmm. and and a train realizing in that moment uh that his if it wasn't for this drug i'd just be treated like any other any other black man in the store and then also his response to it afterwards which was to go training and he get even more hyped up on that stuff and with, when he was trying to pull the train and mm-hmm. his brother just like or a trainer was just like, dude, really, you you need to get off this stuff now. It's going basically he was just trying to tell him it's going to kill him, and and he just didn't want to have a, any more part of it. But A Train was just so wrapped up in the the celebrity, and I think that moment in the store like remind was like, I guess uh, a way of for for A Train reinforcing why it's so important to be a celebrity and be this star because otherwise I'm just going to get treated like just some just random schlup schmo and when I when I go to a high-end department store right right you know and with the deep now the deep doesn't have that poignant moment because it's the deep so he's still going to be the butt to every joke Mm -hmm. but he also goes through a very similar thing because starlight comes out totally exposes him and so madeline decides okay we got to take the deep very um very uh, times up moment or Mm -hmm. Uh, me too moment that occurred in this last half and so he's sent to indiana i think yeah and uh uh, sandusky ohio ohio thank you i knew it wasn't i knew it i sorry i watched parks and rec this weekend so that's why (laughs) indiana stuck in my head but you just he's like completely isolated clearly everybody's turning on him and you know, after the epic dolphin rescue fail, you would think it couldn't get any worse. And then he's in a shop and he tries to save a lobster, just one lobster. Yeah, yeah. I remember that, yeah. But no, he can't even have that win. Like, yep. there's some, like, and it's not even empathy. There's Chase Crawford is probably having the time of his life playing this character because it must be so much fun to not be the the monstrous one of the bunch, which is clearly Homelander, but also not be the goody two shoes. He's kind of like just this, you know, he he's in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, the deep is a is a stand in for Aquaman, and it's oh, it's yeah. like the it's the deep it's the disrespect that and the butt of jokes that Aquaman has been throughout comic book history until here recently with. Uh, with uh, Jason Momoa taking over the character. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely that dynamic going on there. Uh, I want to speak to a little bit about the, the apology, because uh, I know it was... It, and it, <laughs> <laughs> I love that scene. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but it, you know, it 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 just it just again reinforces how well this show and how brilliant this show is because it it it, it just it, it plays on so much of the cynicism in our society, and and. And it's a very bleak show when you think about it, because it really is. I think the best one of the best memes I've seen over the last week was uh, how America thinks of itself, and it has Henry Cavill as Superman, and how mm-hmm. America really is, and it's and it's Homelander. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and 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 that scene with with the deep and this apology also it it it, it captures that spirit of that of that that meme very well as, as also with how even with this apology and and how cynical how people will take a very serious topic and like package it and try to repurpose it for their own corporate means and who, you know who cares about the carnage that it, it causes because clearly you still have star starlight who is like traumatized by this event deep is so clueless like he reminds me of some of whenever we saw the uh, people coming out, actresses coming out during Me Too, and how some actors were like, "Well, uh, you know, I think like Matt Damon, I, I think Ben Affleck both had some like foot and mouth moments mm-hmm. uh, uh, as it relates to that, and, and it kind of reminded me of, of, of those those statements that some people made when their fellow uh, professionals were, were 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 talking about what happened to them. It actually, yeah, I spot on. And for me, looking at just the character itself of the deep in that moment, it's very similar to a train, like being given this opportunity to remind every the audience like this is why you should be empathetic of me, but then going too far. Mm -hmm. and and being like no this is why you should always be scripted (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) because if the publicist was there then it would work because and and that's in that moment too with the deep trying to memorize these lines like clearly he needs an acting coach because Mm -hmm. he's not really being able to convey the sympathy he doesn't believe the words he's saying exactly and and so again which is you know there is a point like we keep empath- empathize or placing emphasis on the point that they were literally kids who were given drugs and became this other people. They've been around people who have been telling them what to say, what to wear, a wh- where to go, who to be with, and all of this stuff for all of their life. Like they're a contract. They're not a human being anymore. Right. Yeah. And so I think in these situations, what we started to see is the writers very cleverly put them in situations where you suddenly see them taken out of that context and like, no, this is who you really are. You realize that, right? And, and it's it's hard. Um, Maeve had had a moment where she was starting, she had some PTSD to work through with everything that happened on the airplane. And I love towards the end, how she has that moment with starlight reminding starlight you know what? I've been here longer. Mm-hmm. I've done this longer. And you need to get your own story because this isn't, you're not original. Right, right. <laughs> and this is my story. So butt out and um, go play your part elsewhere because you, you can't take my, all of my damage and all of my burdens. And it was, it was, I don't know why that really worked for me. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, but I really liked that moment because it did feel like Starlight was just continued to play that same sympathy card over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad they, I know we talked during the first four episodes that we would like to learn more about her and, and she really was a very broken individual and, Thinking about the scenes with her and Starlight, and uh, and also seeing Maeve with her, with her former partner, mm-hmm. uh, and just whenever she was at her at her lowest, she 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 went back to her to like, hey, it, I I need you, and it, it was very inter- especially looking at Starlight and Huey, and how Huey and Starlight they've developed this relationship with you know, with a non soup and and was very important needed one another to to help them get through 
you know, in Huey's case, getting over Robin's death, and and Starlight's case, trying to find her place in this in this in this new world that she really didn't want to have a part of, but her mother her mother forced her into, uh, and so it. it, it to, to your other point, whenever they were filming the, in, in particular in episode six, when they were filming those the, the fake movie as far as her fake life stories and stuff and and Maeve was trying to have an intimate conversation with or, or, or no conversation with a friend and the people behind her were like trying to like you know use that very office type of moment to get them in a candid unscripted moment and uh, that how that just sort of again shows how these people have been gr- primed and, and bred to just basically be these corporate uh, entities and and not real people, and, and and then when she finally did break down and 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 say, look, you know, my story about my arm broken arm is in fact real. Yeah, it it was a very, it, it was a very poignant moment in that you know, throughout even even whenever stories may be embellished, there there actually may be a kernel of truth to it, but it it. The, the way this, this world has been set up for these people, you just can't believe anything that's being said about them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think we talked about this last week, too, that it be, was very apparent that these the writers didn't focus too much time on how many lives these soups have actually saved. Mm-hmm. It was more about how big of douches and how they screw up and they can't even save a dolphin. Yeah. And in this moment, Maeve reminds Starlight and the viewers that, no, we actually have saved a lot of people. We have our own scars from those those events, and not everything you see is fabricated. I mean, some of it is, but some of it is also very true, especially when they were young. I mean, Homelander and Maeve, they're the oldest ones. Mm-hmm. They've probably been doing this for a good 20-plus years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they, there was a starting point, like where they are now with Vought, mm-hmm. like you have to build to get there. So Vought wasn't always Vought, right? Madeline right. wasn't always pulling the strings. Right, right. Um. So, so again, and also then that, that tried, tries to make you try to figure out, well, like who really is Maeve? Like. Who or who is she is now because she's grown and evolved just as much as Vought has. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I find it interesting how we have spent probably a good twenty minutes talking about the boys, the yeah. show, without talking about the boys. <laughs> We've only talked about the seven. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll be honest. They were the best part of the show. The boys, of, I mean, Billy is a really good character. Billy, he he kind of, he, he, he went a bit rogue on us in this later half of the season where you could just see his own mission, his own agenda wasn't getting accomplished. So he just had to put pedal to the metal and and do some choices I don't really think were necessary but he ultimately does get the full story of what happened to his wife. Yeah, yeah, and and, and, it, and getting that story, it, it definitely caused him to go into the red and just. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and. Were you shocked by that reveal? Um, I what well, I I think I I figured there had to be something to that was obviously driving him because I was like, Oh, he's just, he's had, I, I thought it could have been where the, the, the soups had failed him and he was just disillusioned with them. And, and that was sort of driving on. And then of course, as we got deeper into the series, I guess it was episodes five or six where he, we, we see his, the, the uh, his relationship with his wife. And then of course the, um, the, the the dinner party is the Christmas party. Yeah, it, it 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 definitely caught me by surprise. Yeah, I made the mistake of watching or reading a brief article 
um, about some of the plot points in season one that didn't necessarily go mm-hmm. into or follow um, the books. Yeah. So I kind of knew already that he raped her, mm-hmm. but I still think that I, for some reason, I wasn't thinking she was still alive or or right. his Homelander's monologue at the end um, with Madeline and, and Billy it distracted me enough to where after the explosion goes off and Billy winds up on the lawn, I'm like, okay, where are we? What's going on? Right. And right. then to get the reveal of the son and, and his wife, I'm just like, Oh, yeah. this is so cool. And it, I do, it, it was, it, it's such a bittersweet ending. It is. It is. It is a bittersweet ending. And I, I, I felt for, Felt for Billy in that moment because it was just, well, let me dial it back a bit. So, Homelander and Billy are just, are, are clearly two men with a mission. And, I, and, and in some ways they're very similar in that single-mindedness determination to, to, achieve, to achieve their ends. Um, so whenever Billy and Homelander and, and were squared off there in the, in the house at the end, uh, I was, I was, I was wondering how that was to sort of all play out. And I didn't see Homelander like, you know, frying Madeline there. That was like, damn, okay. He's just, you know, he's balls through the wall, like going to just take the whole house down with him. And so, and and deprive and he deprived Billy of that that opportunity. So when he ended up when he ended up on the lawn, I was just like, I actually I thought it might have been Black Noir who actually came in and saved saved Billy. <laughs> no, because he's too I, busy playing the piano. He's too busy playing the piano. But I, I did read somewhere where he is actually and spoiler alert for for folks. Uh, and spoiler if hold your ears there if you don't want to know. But apparently he was he's also. Um. I think he was created to basically be a check on Homelander. Mm-hmm. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if that's something that gets revealed in the second season, because for these last few episodes, I've been wondering, I'm like, what is the point of black noir? And also what is his powers? <laughs> and does he sweat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I liked how he became that character, like who, uh, when Homelander is talking to everybody about how he's figured out Dewey's connection to the boys. Um, he's like, all of you have been such a disappointment or something, except you, Black Noir, you've been great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he has been great. Yeah. <laughs> Give him a line. <laughs> Give him a line, yeah. Yeah, well, he's a hell of a piano player, I know that, so. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, the, but, uh, but as far as the, the rest of the boys, I know, I, I I know we've been focusing on the seven. I think I really liked the arc with um, Frenchie and the. Um, well, I, I don't. Did, what was her name? I can't. I don't know her name. Um, I want to say it's like Miko or Kamiko. Yeah. Um, but I could be mistaken. But I I agree. Like Frenchie and her that dynamic. And, and with every now and then the added dynamic of Mother's Milk, um, because he never liked Frenchie. Right. Yeah. It, it worked. I mean, I, and, and to be honest, I don't feel like the writers spent mo- that much time on the boys. A lot of this later half of the season was spent focusing in on the seven and all of their redemption mm-hmm. And and some other plot points because you really had to get to that final moment in the season. So so I don't blame them. I just think it's ironic though that the show is called The Boys, and I really felt like this was the season of the seven. And by the end of it, Homelander is just front and center, smiling those pearly whites. Yeah. Well, I think the boys, but the moments that they did have, like, for example, finding Mesmer, and which was a nice little touch, having Haley Joel Osment, I was like, is that, is that, ish? 
Yeah, because I'm so used to I'm not used to seeing a a, a, a thicker Haley Joel Osment, but uh, but but with Methods Milk and, and and utilizing his connections with his prior life working in the juvenile hall and 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 use, using Mesmer to try to again further this mission as as far as trying to find out more about Compound B and and also just bringing down the soups. I mean, that was a, a nice touch and a nice little little side arc that fed into, again, showing how Billy's... Billy that Billy's all about Billy at the end of the day. I mean, yes... I, he, I, I do have to say, though, Billy and the baby he uses yeah. to, um, to get out of that lab... I think did build a very um, strong father son relationship in that moment. Oh yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> it surely did. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. But uh, well, I, I mean, I think uh, again, I think you, you, your point earlier that this season was about the seven, and the boys are in a. In, each, I guess, small arc they had with each of the characters were, was very important as far as Mother's Milk and Frenchie. I think they're clearly supporting characters, so they, they used them as how supporting characters should be used. Mm-hmm. And really, the, at the end of the day, the story, as far as the boys, just, at least this first season, was obviously Billy's story and, and Huey's story. And and Huey, mm-hmm. um, yeah, and, and Huey, especially when you think about where and, and how Huey and Billy are different, because uh, thinking back again, we can't help but get back to the, the seven. But when A Train had the heart attack because of taking too much Compound V, if that if Billy had been there, Billy would have been like fuck him and walk out walked out the door. Whereas Huey would be, Huey clearly still has a conscience. And despite the fact that he was enraged and wanted to bring a train down for killing, killing Robin, he still retains some of that humanity. And, and so that was, I think that's where, where we, when we see, when they do focus on the boys, that's where we see the difference in, just like the seven, we see the different layers of, of, of the boys and how each one of them deals with trying to take out the soups. Well, it's more about how each of the, one of them deals with revenge. Because yeah, with yeah. Huey and Billy, and it, this is kind of why Billy, in a way, chooses Huey to align himself with, is because he Huey finds himself in a very similar situation where this super individual took away the person I love the most in the world and I want revenge and apology is not, not enough. A payoff is not enough. Like yeah. real revenge. Yeah. Um, so do you have anything else you want to add to this discussion about the boys? No, I, I think it's uh, season one was, as you said earlier, very, especially towards the end of the series, very pointed about the, the seven, but um, I truly enjoyed this series, and I I see why uh, Amazon renewed it for a second season before it even came on board because came on television because it, it it truly is a like like Doom Patrol it definitely is a uh, game changing show that uh, breaks the mold of what we what we've been watching up to this point in, in a refreshing way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, where can our listeners find you? Yes, our listeners can find me at Will M. Polk, that's W-I-L-L-M-P-O-L-K. You can find me at S.J. Belmont, S-J-B-E-L-M-O-N-T. Please follow our crew on Twitter at Cena Nerd. Friend us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. But most importantly, rate, subscribe, and comment on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Spotify. Good night, geek out. You're welcome. Something ended, everybody.